Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing organizations that support those living with limb loss. A very uncomfortable topic, but let's make it comfortable. I'm looking forward to learning more from our special guest today, Mary Richards, President and CEO of the Amputee Coalition in Tennessee, and Lucy Frazier, Executive Director of the Limbs for Life Foundation in Oklahoma. Two million people in the U.S. live with limb loss, and in less than 30 years, that number go, that number is going to more than double. And it's, it's more common than, than people uh, realize. 28 million Americans are currently at risk for amputation. And by tomorrow, there'll be another 507 individuals facing the emotional, physical, lifestyle, and financial challenges uh, that, that uh, come with, with this condition. So, uh, Mary, tell us about the Amputee Coalition and how you would help me if I were to be so unfortunate as to be in an accident or through some sort of uh, condition, uh, such as diabetes, uh, had, to, had to live with limb loss. How would you help me? That's a great question, Mark, and thank you so much for having uh, having us here and for having this conversation about an important topic. And I, one of the tenets of the Amputee Coalition is that limb loss is not uncommon and is becoming less uncommon every day. It is a part of the foundation of our organization, um, as well as two other tenets. So no amputee alone. I'll talk a little bit about that and living well with limb loss, that there is living life to the fullest after amputation. Um, The Amputee Coalition does serve the 2.1 million Americans living with limb loss and limb difference. So folks who were born with a congenital limb difference. Um, We believe very strongly that if you were to, um, the most common causation pathway to um, going through an amputation surgery is is a peripheral artery disease, vascular disease, and diabetes. That's the overwhelming majority of the 185,000 amputation surgeries every year through that causation pathway. And sadly, with COVID-19, we also saw a preponderance of blood clots that um, can cause uh, limb loss. Um, And much like sepsis, it's a systemic illness that has you in emergency care and in ICU care for some period of time before you're actually able to navigate the loss of limb, right? That that is one part of- So this could happen, but this could literally happen to me tomorrow. But if I had a blood clot, this could happen to me tomorrow. That's right. And if it would, then there are things, we have the National Limb Loss Resource Center, um, which has unbiased, um, validated information. We have a packet that we can send to you and to your family members to help you navigate the amputation itself and recovery, rehabilitation, and return to community, return to work, whatever works best for you. We believe that Patients. So the Amputee Coalition is a little bit of a patient advocacy organization, a little bit of a disability organization. Um, and there are times when we think of ourselves as being patients, there are times when we're just members of the community. But in that, in that um, hospitalization period, in the period of recovery, as we are adjusting, as our family is adjusting, as we're working with our workplace and others, there um, we have a publication called First Step um, and Your New Journey. And it is um, sort of the what to expect when you're expecting, but for, for amputation surgery, if you're familiar with that book that helps folks who are dealing or who have a pregnancy. Um, we hope to make sure that whatever the causation pathway, there is a life lived well with limb loss. It does engage some of the work that Lucy does. We know that there's also coexisting conditions that need to be well managed. Um, we want for folks to have unbiased information about what to expect how to navigate your different healthcare providers, how to make sure that you um, go through the initial period of recovery and then rehabilitation to be able to set patient asserted recovery values, help us to achieve better health outcomes. And then we also want to pair anyone who's going through an amputation. We want to pair you with someone who's gone through something similar. We have a certified peer visitor program, and that is someone who has lived experience and expertise that will help you go through the experience of hospitalization and recovery. How do you talk with your spouse or loved one about the changes that you're experiencing? How do they get the support that they need to have caregiver um, program to help folks with certified peer visitors on the caregiver side? Um, And then we also have uh, support groups that we, um, there's one every single week online um, in a period of COVID where people are at higher risk. We want for folks to have in-person engagements when it's safe and helpful um, and online and virtual engagements when that's necessary. 
And then once you get to a period of uh, through that period of recovering rehabilitation, when you have a, a sense of self and, and a sense of, of um, wanting to give back lived experience is expertise that we want to share with others. And when that moment happens, becoming a certified peer visitor yourself is something that I think people find um, we want to help to empower people living with limb loss to live the life they most want to live. So let's let's get let's get uh, back to that. Uh, Lucy, you wouldn't know um, whether um, I am missing a leg. Uh, That's correct. It, it, and, it, and it wouldn't affect my work as a search professional. I do executive search for for nonprofits. You wouldn't know this. Right. Um, I don't know whether whether uh, you are living with limb loss or whether Mm -hmm. any members of your family uh, is just just by uh, through these interactions. Yet our attitudes sometimes are are uh, far different than the um, objective impact that it might have in our in our workplace or in our friendships or whatever. Could you talk a little bit about how your constituents see the difference between their their lives before and after and what kind of ways in which they not only have to adjust themselves, but also educate um, people who who have not necessarily had to themselves live with this uh, with this condition. Well, the Limbs for Life Foundation, our our uh, main client is the person who has no access to health care, either because of their income level, the inability to afford insurance. Our main goal is to get those those folks provided with a limb so that they can get back to life as they remember it. That may mean back to work. It may mean back to self-care. It may mean um, just being able to cook dinner for their family. But whatever it is, they, they want their life back. We have a board member who's an amputee, and he has often said that the, there's a cure for amputation, and it's a prosthetic limb. And uh, we are able, that's what we're here for, is to provide that piece of uh, normalcy that can put the amputee back to work, back to life, back to standing on two feet and being able to assist in their uh their personal care as well as that of their family. And it's quite extraordinary. Now, I was just, I was in a restaurant and um, in walks, uh, this gentleman walking with, with a normal gait. I was completely unaware. His legs were, were both prosthetics. It's quite amazing what can be done today. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how uh, sort of the, the supply chain of finding somebody um, a prosthetic and getting them fitted and getting them trained to use it, particularly somebody who does not necessarily have the income level um, that allows them to take off of work and, and allows them um, the luxury of being able to uh, afford uh, this service, uh, which is so important to their lives. How, do, how does that actually function? If I came in and I said, look, I have a need and I can't afford it, what, what happens there? Well, for, for Limbs for Life, what our routine goes like this. Uh, we ask people to complete an application uh, where they provide us with information about their family size, their income level, um, their access to insurance, when the date of their amputation was, how long they've been healing, if it's an old amputation, are they currently wearing a prosthetic, and if so, how old is that prosthetic? to get the basic idea of, of who, we're, who we're dealing with. Then what makes our service work is that we partner with prosthetic clinics across the country. Um, right now we work with about an average of 300 a year. Um, and what we see is that people in the prosthetic and care industry are, are caring people and that's why they're in that job. Um, if they if they weren't if or if they're not then they don't stay long in that job. Um, so most prosthetic clinics are helping people um, and will do some pro bono work. And and what Limbs for Life does is we help those clinics to be able to do more of that. Um, and that's by providing 
a, uh, a small stipend for the payment of their, their time and their work to make the fitted socket that uh, fits the leg to the residual limb, as well as we provide donated parts as available. Um, we have a warehouse of uh, used and uh, donated new equipment, and um, it's, uh, it's quite... Um, quite a system here. I just was glancing through our inventory notes. We have sent out or distributed uh, 355 sets of donated materials just since January 1 this year. And that's inter internationally. So that's um, amazing. Yeah. What is the average cost, uh, Mary, of a, of a prosthetic in terms of um, not the donated uh, limbs, but also the the manufactured uh, new limbs. How much does it cost to supply the limb, but also then to get it fitted? And then, and then, Lucy, if you can jump in and talk about um, how you ameliorate that cost. So it's a little bit of a complicated answer, but I'll try to keep it quick here. So the cost of a prosthetic device and the care for the device is bundled. So it's one payment for both. And it depends on what type of healthcare insurance you have or not, as Lucy was saying, not everyone does have health insurance. But for example, if you're in the veterans um, health system, it is gonna be vastly different than if you're um, someone who is on Medicare or Medicaid, which folks who are living with a disability should be able to, you can call the National Limb Loss Resource Center, they'll help you with putting in an application to um, become, so, so Medicare serves folks who are 65 and older and people living with disabilities. And if your amputation surgery puts you in a place where you have a disability, you can apply for Medicare. And if you are then in a certain category, you may also, you may also qualify for Medicaid, which is the state program, state run program um, that is partially funded by the federal government. So all of that means that they, from a patient perspective, what I care about most is not the cost of the device to others, but what is my out of pocket? How do I obtain access to needed healthcare, including prosthetic care? And I think that Lucy does a really great job of kind of figuring out how the on the ground it works, but I, um, the cost can range significantly as well. So if my goal after limb loss is to be able to go grocery shopping on my own after upper limb loss, that is a really important goal for me. And someone else may need a running blade to return to running marathons, which would not be the case for me. But we want for folks to have the devices and the care that's necessary for them to return to that life that they want to live. And I'm not trying to dodge your question, but I also know that the wide range of expenditure that's related to the device itself may or may not actually land on the checkbook or the pocketbook of the patient. It really has a lot to do with insurance coverage, the type of healthcare finance system that you're a part of. The VA is very little cost sharing for patients. Um, I know that there are, my dad is a veteran. Um, I know there are lots of veterans who may or may not get their care through the VA. I can't tell you what a wonderful partner they've been to our organization and to the folks that we serve. And most veterans come to the limb loss community through the same pathways as everyone else, diabetes and vascular disease. So we really want to encourage folks to think about the tools that are available and we can help you with those applications and some of the bureaucratic part of this so that you get the care that you need so that you can get back to the soccer field and watch your grandkid or get down to the market and pick out your own apples. I mean, we want for folks to be able to do the life that they most want. And from my vantage point, that's as impressive as... Uh, you know, um, some of the folks that we do see during the Paralympics, we all have our own goals and we all need to be able to live a life that is most fulfilling to us. But let me hand it over to Lucy to talk a little bit about with the complicated healthcare, like the finance component of healthcare, what I think Lucy and I both orient ourselves around is the patient experience. How do we help that family? How do we help that person? Um, and I will say that we also have legislation on Capitol Hill called the AAA Study Act that will through a nonpartisan research project, we wanna understand who is assessed for a prosthetic device. 
with only 35% of people living with limb loss and limb difference have access to a prosthesis. Why is that? Can we help folks have the assessment as well as the prosthetic care and the assistive technologies that are necessary to return to a life lived well? And do people do better in one type of healthcare insurance environment than another? And if that's the case, how do we take those experiences and stretch it out across the other types of care delivery systems? And we really think that there's a, there's a lot to be learned and the basis for public policy improvements for years to come. I thought I would keep it quick, but I really didn't, Mark. So let me hand it back to Lucy to talk a little bit about how they help people live that life that they well, you make. Well, you make a few important points. So let me just highlight them and then, Lucy, if you could comment. First of all, um, it, uh, 67% of the people who responded to our last poll said, that they, have, they know someone or themselves have experienced uh, limb loss. So it's, it's quite a broad swath of people who are affected by this. But you make a couple of really important points. First of all, you make the point that, um, that uh, prosthesis have, are purpose-built. So the purpose for which you're going to use that prosthesis, and there might be multiple prostheses uh, that are required for different purposes in a person's life, um, it's, it's so incredibly important. The second point that I think is so very uh, critical here is that we don't have equal access or equal capability for access to these, uh, these devices, to the training, to the support. And it really does depend on, um, on the relationships that you have, the wealth that you've been able to accumulate in your life, the circumstances, whether you're uh, a veteran or not. And you could have neighbors literally having completely different experiences at completely different cost levels. It seems that, that the, the way we are approaching this um, may not be uh, particularly uh, optimized for, uh, for the impact that we want to have on people. Lucy, could you comment on those two issues? One is the fact that people have different needs at different stages in their lives. Um, and and those, how do we accommodate those various needs, particularly people without the means uh, to afford uh, these various devices? And secondly, the inequities that are built into the system and whether we in the United States are actually doing as well as other industrialized co uh, countries in this regard. Mm -hmm. Our client is uh, usually the, uh, uh, the person living on that that edge of poverty. And many are impacted by limb loss, as Mary said, from diabetes and uh, vascular disease, which um, is worse in those states that don't have uh, healthy outcomes. So do your, do, do your services focus on those states where there is less insurance uh, available to people? Um, yes. how, how does that work? In the, I mean, if you look at the United States map, how, did, how is it colored in in okay. terms of, uh, of, your, of your services? I'm glad you asked that question because that's something that's very close to my heart. There are, uh, in, in all 50 states, the state Medicaid will provide uh, limbs for people under the age of 18. Everyone, uh, every child can have access to a prosthetic. But at the age Medicaid, of, that's all 50 for states. Medicaid, that's all 50 states. Um, and again, we're talking about those of a certain uh, um, income level. At the age of 18, in many states, that coverage stops. So we have this population of young people from 19 to 25, because maybe they don't have the ability to go straight into a job where they have quality health insurance, um, who are living with a limb that was made for them when they were 16 or 17 years old. And they've grown, they've changed, they have broken parts. Um, a limb is like a shoe, it, it, uh, it, it, they wear out. So, um, even an adult needs a new limb every three to five years. We've seen people who are walking on limbs who have been wearing them for 12 years. Um, you make do with what you have oftentimes if it's not accessible to you. But uh, to address the point of, of states, we see more applications and provide more services within those states where Medicaid does not pay for adult prosthetics. 
those states are Oklahoma, Texas, Mississippi, first, first off, top of the list. And then uh, some of the other states that have limited coverage are uh, Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee, and uh, Georgia, Georgia and North Carolina. Uh, so we get a lot of clients from those areas as well. When it See, comes that's, that's, that's very interesting. So you have here uh, some of the other downstream effects of the embrace or lack thereof uh, of health funding um, and uh, changes to insurance policies. It, it's just very, very interesting to see those kinds of changes um, uh, uh, have such an impact on people. Uh, Mary, if you if you take a look at, at mapping the work that you do for the amputee coalition, do you find in a similar mapping in your experience to what Mary was talking about, where there are certain areas of the country where the response, our collective response, uh, helps people with limb loss more than others. Uh, what is your experience in comparison to Lucy's? So, so the Amputee Coalition was was founded, and we were we were based in Knoxville, Tennessee, for many years, and we're we're now based in Washington, D.C. We have a national footprint, so we do education, advocacy, support, and prevention work across the United States, and we're involved in um, you know public policy as well as the education and information that folks need to live life well with limb loss through the resource center. Um, so I think that our missions are slightly different whilst we stand in like a slightly different place, looking at a shared community with shared values. And I think that that's where partnership is always so important. Um, I don't need to be an expert the way that in the areas in which Lucy is an expert because we can partner with her instead. Right. And the National Limb Loss Resource Center points people to limbs for life when they need assistance with obtaining a prosthetic device. So that's a wonderful way in which I don't have to replicate. I get to, we do what we do, shared community, shared values. Lucy does what she does, same, same vibe, right? And, and so, Mary, we send many people to the MPT Coalition for your uh, wealth of information and resources and every day. And it's just, and thank you so much because both our organizations and both of us as people want to make sure that every American who needs the supports in order to live that life well with limb loss finds both of us in our organizations and our other partner organizations who can help them achieve that goal. I will say that in terms of our footprint, we have 80 some hospital and rehabilitation partners across the country. We are actively seeking partnerships with organizations that have a depth and breadth of expertise in that shared community. So, um, you know, we work with the National Health Council on public policy issues. I think that one of the things that's important to us is that in health insurance needs to be high quality patient centered health insurance needs to be available to everyone who needs it. And every, you know, the Affordable Care Act is, is something that was a bill that was put in place. And we've heard a lot about the different elements of the ACA. But the Affordable Care Act also said that baseline health insurance must cover prosthetic devices. And so that is, but implementation is also something that public policy organizations and advocacy organizations need to stay after. So that's part of what we do in Washington is to see why it is that policy and practice don't look the way that we anticipated that they would. So my question yeah. in linking to, to, to Lucy's was, was really about, Lucy made the point that in certain states, the need is, is higher than in certain other states. Yeah, so, and I'll just share that too, that African-Americans are four times more likely to have limb loss and limb difference than Latinx Americans are twice as likely to have limb loss. We do have the social determinants of health. There are a component of that, but better understanding, um, as we know that the diabetes epidemic has hit certain communities harder than others, we know that these are communities that are not special populations for us. They are critical core populations for the limb loss community. And how is it that we can make sure that our services and supports not only reach them, but are designed with um, an iterative process, a dialogue to ensure that they're culturally sensitive, culturally relevant, and are in the communities that need us most. And um, I think that it's a challenge for all nonprofits to ensure that we are um, serving those who need us most. I know that Lucy's focused on that, whether it's socioeconomics, race and, race and ethnicity, we know that there are pockets of need that we all need to make sure that we are focused and really um, intentional about reaching those communities. 
So when when you talk about your analysis of need, uh, Lucy's um, went along geographic lines. What you're saying is that there might be some geographic um, uh, locus, but that but but it's also about race, ethnicity, uh, certain conditions that that actually cluster in certain groups and therefore result in limb loss. Is that, is that what you're basically uh, saying in terms of, as you look at the a map of the United States in terms of how you see the concentration of the problem? Yeah, I think that there is more study that needs to be done to better understand why it is that, that Black Americans are four times more likely. And that's something that we look forward to partnering with our friends at the National Institutes of Health to better understand. And Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services also has some research that they do through the Innovation Center there are ways for us to better understand the why of it all. Um, but there's also challenges related to delivery of healthcare in super urban and super rural areas. So telemedicine, telehealth, access to, if you have bilateral upper limb loss, you need a specialist who knows how to fit upper limb prostheses and has some expertise bilateral is more complicated. So that means both arms are involved. So how is it that we make sure that if that person is living in rural Montana, they get the right prosthetist, the right physical therapists involved in their in their care delivery team to make sure that they do very well? So I'm not just I think that race, ethnicity, socioeconomics all play a role. We want to better understand what that means. And my point point of view is when you know that there are folks who are disproportionately impacted, how is it that we're making sure that we're orienting our services and supports to best meet the needs of that community? Um, there's no, in all of the history of patient advocacy, shame and blame have never gotten us anywhere. So this is not to say that the, there are people who are at fault for losing a limp. That is not helpful. That is not a way that we think. What I do think is when you know that there's a part of our community that needs us, we got to show up. And how is it that we are listening and learning and showing up where we're most needed? So we're coming to the end of our time. Um, just in, in, a, in a very short nugget, uh, Lucy, if you could uh, give us some advice on how we should uh, uh, reshape uh, services so that more Americans can, um, who, who live with limb loss, can live a really full and productive and enjoyable uh, life, uh, regardless of, uh, of income, how should we be thinking about um, how the U.S. should function um, to embrace people who live with limb loss? And then, Mary, if you could also give your comment, how should we change? Uh, Lucy, what um, do you think? Well, my, my feeling is that um, the people who live in the states where uh, they are aware that, that Medicaid does not cover basic prosthetic limbs for adults. Please make your voice heard, make it known, call your congressman, tell them this is not right. Um, in, in a state like Oklahoma, where, where I live, if you have, um, if you lose one limb, you cannot, that, that in itself does not um, afford you disability coverage because they will give you a wheelchair, but they will not provide you with a leg. And there's just something wrong there. We need to allow our people to live their best lives. And also, Lucy, is the, the idea that we are able to better identify what types of healthcare interventions allow people to live the life that they most want to live helps all Americans with, it helps the health economy, it helps workplaces. Um, disability is also a part of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Um, we, we partner with a group called Disability In, and they have an index of companies that have a diverse workplace, including people living with disabilities. And we know that that improves the bottom line for publicly traded companies and anyone else. So while we are a nonprofit, we also um, know that most of our the folks that we serve work um, work for work, work in in a, in a um, corporate America or in other places, and we know that that is um, a benefit to companies to have people who are um, uh, living with disability who are part of their workforce. I do think that um, the amputee coalition through our advocacy work, um, you can come and find your look up your representative and communicate with them through our website. Um, the AAA Study Act does call for better understanding 
why it is that some folks are getting a prosthetic device and others are not, and then being able to take those lessons learned and applying them across the different health insurances to ensure that all Americans have access to the care that they need. We know it improves quality of life. We know it extends extends life, and we know that it can actually um, help uh, both our friends and neighbors as well as our families themselves as we make sure that people get the care that they need when they need it most. Um, and then I do think that in terms of, um, you know, I, the Paralympics just ended in, in a couple weeks back now. And I think that there is something about American exceptionalism that is displayed in a resilient and agile community. Folks living with limb loss um, are folks who know how to adapt. And I think that especially in a COVID-19 environment where we're all trying to find ways of finding our own resilience and finding our ways of navigating uncertainty in life, I have the great pleasure of working with a community of people who are tremendously expert at knowing how to do exactly that work. I think that rather than seeing this as an other situation, um, there is 2.1 million Americans. It, it, by point of example, that's the same size of the population as people living with Parkinson's, right? So um, how many folks do you know who have a friend or loved one who's living with Parkinson's? We are everywhere. And, um, you know, depending on, on your attire, you may or may not know that the person sitting next to you on the metro in the morning is the person living with limb loss. Um, I do think that lived experience is expertise. We know that there are ways in which we can learn from each other. I just think that rather than seeing this as a difference, we actually can benefit from engaging everyone in our community who happens to um, happens to have been able to overcome challenges. And that is not to suggest that every day is easy, but there is um, uh, that's part of why no amputee alone is a big part of our mission. And that is so that folks can get to know each other. Our national conference goes on through the end of the month. So if folks want to join the national conference, we have support sessions and all sorts of breakout sessions. So you can get to know other people living with limb loss. Um, and I, I just really appreciate the opportunity to talk about not only the access to assistive technologies that allow us to get around in our lives as best as possible, but also to think about um, this is a community that has, has some wonderful attributes, um, and, and life is, uh, life is very challenging for many folks right now. And, and, and knowing folks who've been through challenges and are surviving and thriving in, in spite of them, um, I think is, uh, is a way in which we can also enrich our own lives and enrich the lives of the folks that we work with. And the well, let's 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 the not be, be, yeah. be the last word. Um, I, I think one of the things that we all need to think about, um, we should think about how the country should be shaped to be uh, hospitable to all Americans. Mm -hmm. There's a justice piece to this, but there's also a calculus. We tend to look at the cost only. But if we look at it as net benefit, right? Yes, helping people with limb loss is costly. But if we look at it as net benefit, it is less costly to help than it is to not help. In other words, it costs more to not help. It's not as if we have a choice of either there's going to be a cost or there's going to be no cost. It's a comparative cost. So not helping creates a higher cost than helping. And if we think about it in those terms, we will invest. Mary Richards, President and CEO of the Amputee Coalition in Tennessee, and Lucy Frazier, Executive Director of the Limbs for Life Foundation, Oklahoma. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom uh, with us. Thank you for educating me. Um, thank your, uh, your communities, your constituents, your clients, your funders, and, and really stay safe in this uh, crazy COVID time. Keep doing your great work. Attendees, thank you for your contributions and for your attention. And we'll see you on Tuesday again. Take care, all.